Onyx. Now we just changed the name about two years ago, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm a professor here. I, I now serve as the chair of this uh, this uh, area, and uh, my office is in Engineering Research Center, uh, which is a building diagonal from here. And now, uh, if you have additional questions after today's uh, presentation, you can also email me. That's probably the easiest way to, 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 to catch me. <coughs> yeah, th this one is nice. ASU email address is always first name dot the last name at asu.edu. So you, as long as you remember the name, you remember the email address. Uh, we are the largest uh, uh, area or division in School of ECE. We have about 75 faculty members on, on tenured or tenure track. And 30 of them are actually in uh, physical electronics, photonics. Here is a list of uh, all the names of the faculty we have. And uh, the latest person is. Uh, oh, this is, uh, sure, this is not the latest version. We have. Uh, oh, it's the latest version. Ivan is the latest uh, the person we hired last semester. So, and then if Ivan's name is here, I know everybody's name is on here. So, uh, and uh, yeah, some of them have uh, uh, interests in multiple areas. And this is just one of the areas that like David Ali and, uh, uh, is one of them, and uh, Jennifer is another one. So, uh, but my name is, I don't have a star after my name. That means this is my main area. <coughs> Uh, so let me explain a little bit about uh, what is uh, uh, electronics, what is photonics, and uh, uh, physical electronics. It's the science and technology of materials, devices, and the systems that uh, involve the control of electrons. Now I hope you still remember your chemistry 101. All the materials are made of atoms, and atoms have a nuclear inside, a bunch of electrons around it. And now, you know, atom is very, very tiny. But if you look at those electrons, the electron is about a thousand of the weight of the nucleus. So it's a very, very tiny particles. But that's what we try to control here. So in the very early days, and I guess many of you probably have never seen these vacuum tubes. And when I was younger than your age, I remember my dad had a radio set, and if you open the, the back inside, and there are like five or six of those vacuum tubes inside. <coughs> then by the time I was like a teenager, I started to put a, like a, what we call discrete transistors. That means that you have individual diodes uh, uh, transistors, then you put multiple of them into a circuit, then they serve as either radio set or TV set. And uh, But this is the first uh, Transistor. This was about 1948 at the Bell Laboratories, and uh, they invented the first transistor that started the whole solid state of physical electronics uh, uh, thing. And uh, now that was a one transistor on this big, about the one inch by one inch uh, uh, germanium uh, 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 wafer. But now, if we have one inch by one inch uh, silicon wafer, you can put it over a billion transistors on it. So you have this, what we call, very large scale integrated circuits. And uh, that's, that's a step from that. And then once we have integrated circuits, you can make now computers. And uh, in old days, computers are really, actually, people start to build computers with vacuum tubes. So those are like enormous. And, uh, and uh, the computer is like a three size of this room. But the power is not as powerful as your laptop, because your laptop contains much more these uh, 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 transistors than the number of vacuum tubes in those systems. So Mac it was one of the Mac is already I mean, 25 years old, or maybe 30 years old. I remember when I was it started after my math degree, I worked in a university back in China, and I remember using one of those Mac computers. And, but now, if you look at how powerful your laptop is, it's really amazing. The progress over the last uh, all started with with this transistor. So that's why uh, the person who invented this, his name is John Bardeen. And now he passed away in 1992. And uh, he 
worked at the University of Illinois for many, many years, for decades, and uh, I got my PhD from that university. Okay, photonics. What is photonics? <coughs> the science and technology of generating, controlling, and detecting light or photon, uh, which are particles of light. Now, photon is probably a new name for you. Light, we typically think is as a wave. But actually, if you look at the modern physics, if you have a quantum mechanics and light actually has many, many of small particles, which we call photons, then we try to control those photons. That's photonics. And now I'm using a, a, a green laser, and you can have a blue laser, you can have a red laser. We also have a professor here who works on white laser. You know, what's the difference between a, a blue laser and a white laser? A white light is not a single wavelength. Blue is a single wavelength. So white laser actually is a three wavelengths mixed in a right proportion, so it, it appears to be white. So it's much more difficult than just have a red or blue or green laser. And uh, integrated photonics, then just like uh, uh, integrated circuits, uh, you integrate multiple uh, electronic devices together. Now here we integrate multiple photonic devices together. And the solar cells part of it, I have another side for solar cells. And uh, all the communication between the United States and Europe or United States and Asia is through optical communication. These are optical fibers. So basically you send is not the electrical signal across the Atlantic Ocean or Pacific Ocean. You send a light signal through those fibers, and then on the other side, you take, receive that light signal, then you decode that into an electrical signal. So all the communication is done by uh, long distance communication, done by uh, optical communication now. So these are just some of the examples. And now this is really the uh, focus area of my research now, photovoltaics, because energy environment sustainability are such a paramount importance these days and uh, so we need to cre create energy generate energy from renewable clean sources so that's what the photovoltaics does the science and technology of generating electrons from photons we want to create a power from sunlight that's uh, generating electrons from photon uh, you probably have seen these solar farms are all the ASU parking garages, and you see uh, solar arrays on, on top of them. But if you get a little bit closer, look at it. A solar system is just many, many, many of these solar panels. Each panel is about uh, four feet by six feet in size. Then if you have a chance to break it uh, up and see what's inside, each panel probably has 60 of these solar cells. And these cells are made of these uh, from these silicon wafers. So you have a silicon wafer, then on the wafer you make a cell. And uh, the wafer actually comes from ultra pure silicon. So you need to get an ultra pure polycrystalline silicon before you can make a wafer. And then the pure silicon comes from quartz. So quartz is really the raw material to make uh, uh, ultra pure silicon wafers. Then the wafers you can make cells. Then 60 cells, you, you connect them into a module, and then many, many modules, you, you have a solar system. So that's how and, uh, this goes. And uh, now, just uh, I, I, I talked about this a little bit uh, and the integrated circuits. That's probably the most, uh, one of the most uh, amazing technical advances in the last uh, 50 years or so. This shows the number of changes that are each chip. That is, if you break your laptop, or you take a chip out, you count the number of changes on it. The number of chip and uh, number of channels on chip over time. Now this is already obsolete, uh, but uh, in the 1970s we were talking about the several thousand transistors on that chip, and uh, by 2010, 2011 we were talking about the one billion transistors. Today we are talking about almost 10 billion transistors. Each transistor makes a logical uh, uh, function in the circuit. So the m the more transistors you have on the same chip, the more powerful that chip becomes. So that's why now your laptop is much more powerful than that three-room computer with a bunch of vacuum tubes inside. Because each vacuum tube is about one inch in diameter and maybe three inch tall. Yeah, look at the size versus the transistor on these chips. These are like 
I'm not sure if you have any idea how thick is your hair, diameter of your hair. That's about 100 micrometers. You know the size of these transistors on these most advanced chips? 10 nanometers. What's 10 nanometers? It's the 10 to the power negative 9, power negative 9 meters. So that's nine orders of magnitude smaller than the typical uh, dimension that we see. So these transistors are really, really tiny. That's why you can put a 10 billion on uh, one uh, inch by one inch chip because each of them is, is, is becoming smaller. Now, okay, I, I need to update this because this is like 2015 data. I, uh, uh, next time I should have uh, new data. But uh, about uh, four years ago, five years ago, global semiconductor industry was $335 billion per year. And then most of them is uh, the chips which goes into computer, goes into your cell phone, goes into almost any electronics. And then you also have memory, and uh, because all computers need memory, and uh, you have uh, logic analog uh, uh, functions, you also have discrete devices. Sometimes we still use discrete. Discrete devices means that uh, one transistor is one device. In the case of that one chip, you have billions of transistors on it. Uh, sometimes we still use discrete devices because sometimes you need a very high power output. That small 10 nanometer device is not going to give you, say, say even two watts. So if in case you need a, a thousand watts, what do you do? You need a device which is about uh, half inch by half inch, just to be able to manage a thousand watts, or output a thousand watts. So yeah, the industry is pretty big and it's still growing. Uh, photonics market, uh, and uh, yeah, this is also a little bit older, and uh, uh, about uh, at that time, 2016, was uh, uh, laser was $10 billion, $11 billion. And uh, now, the laser is just a part of it. If you look at the market segments and uh, our particular storage uh, display, or the uh, screens, the TVs, and uh, if you look at the, uh, yeah, last weekend I was at uh, Costco. If you look at the, 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 the TV these days, like, uh, I bought one for 55 inches and many years ago, and then I bought another one for 75 inches. At that time, that was the biggest one I could find. But now you can find like 19 inch uh, TVs, and uh, 55 inch TVs are like $200 each. <laughs> I spent like uh, maybe $1,200, and, but uh, yeah, just see, the, the size gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The price goes low, becomes lower and lower and lower. That's how technology advances. So, and uh, communication, lithography, and uh, no, but this includes everything which involves uh, photonics or optics. And uh, so the projection that this will be even bigger than, than the semiconductor industry, and uh, next year it will be $700 billion. Now, uh, uh, next time I will have the more accurate data to see actually how big it is today. Yeah, so this is really our focus is really on uh, some kind of semiconductors or some kind of materials that you make a functional photonic or electronic devices or it, it manages the photons or manages controls electrons and then you use, utilize that, of, uh, you put that into a system and then that system will do something for you. So that's the basic uh, 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 electronic system and so inside uh, you see a bunch of semiconductor chips, which are typically silicon chips. And uh, these chips perform analog and digital functions. And uh, one advantage of uh, digital uh, signal processing is that uh, you have very high fidelity. Because everything is turned into 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So you never, as long as you keep it at 0, 1, you will never have Analog, you could have a distortion of the original signal, and so, but the analog is still useful because when I talk, when I talk into this microphone, and my volume goes up and down, my pitch goes up and down, and that's first is recorded, translated into analog signal, then the signal processor will convert that analog signal into a digital signal, so it will all become that zero one zero one. Then that zero one, no matter how long you store them, no matter how many times you you you, you send an email that signal over, it will always be the same voice and same pitch. And uh, semiconductor devices, computer chips, 
that yeah, I just mentioned that they'll consider the building of chips depending on the, the, the chip you have. Uh, so these devices have to be designed, fabricated, measured, modeled, marketed, sold. That's the job of you guys. And also my, my job. My job is to teach you how to do that, and your job is to, to, to actually do these things. So you need to know a little bit about the device physics, circuit design, fabrication technology, mo measurement, the model, uh, modeling, and the measurements. Uh, just to give you uh, some examples of the research uh, going on in, 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 in this uh, physical electronics photonics area. Uh, I, I'm sure you don't know what this is. This is a very high vacuum system for glowing semiconductor thin films. And uh, this is in Professor Zhang's lab, and uh, you can glow like uh, semiconductor, compound semiconductor, for example, gallium and arsenic. You can glow a film of gallium arsenide, or you can glow a film of zinc telluride. And uh, so this is a machine of doing that. And we also have a shared facility in ERC. And uh, everybody, including you guys, if, we, if you have a project and somebody, a professor, willing to pay for the cost of that project, you can go there and use the facility. It does, now it uh, does the same job as what Intel's fab, Intel fabs do. And except that uh, Intel fab, they make one type of chip and uh, they make billions of them. And in this case, we work on all kinds of different projects, but in the same type of uh, uh, lab setting, using very similar equipment. And uh, now this is my focus of area, that is to make a solar cell research, and to, of course, make solar cells more efficient, make them lower cost. But also, uh, part of the issue I'm looking into now is that, is the solar cell technology sustainable? Because people have, many people have the misconception that solar energy is sustainable. We use solar energy, so now we are sustainable. But the point I always try to make is that if the technology to utilize solar energy is not sustainable, we still do not have sustainable energy. So that's a, so you, uh, 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 the research I do in my group is looking into sustainability issues of uh, the solar technology we have. Now this is a white laser. So you see that it has three lasers actually, a red laser, a green laser, and a blue laser. If you have them in the right proportion, then it will give you a white light. And then another big area, uh, as you uh, uh, studied about a couple of years ago, is uh, those what we call gallium nitride semiconductors. And then this gets into a little bit more details. And the gallium nitride, most of the solar cells are made on silicon, and all the Intel chips are, uh, are made on silicon. And the most of the microelectronics or the uh, uh, electronic devices you see are made on silicon. But uh, there are other semiconductors which have better properties in certain aspects than silicon. And gallium nitride is one of them. So, uh, uh, for example, if you look at what's inside here, this is not a silicon. Silicon does not emit the light uh, well. And what's inside here, I think it's uh, green is uh, gallium phosphide based. Gallium and the phosphorus, you mix them in the right ratio, they give you a semiconductor which emits a green light. Okay, semiconductor industry. Uh, what do engineers do in the semiconductor industry? Uh, the circuit design. Actually, I had a couple of students who are doing circuit designs at Intel. And they are really, really well paid. And uh, simulation modeling, that's still what we do. And the fabrication, and uh, I'm not sure. Not as you don't see that uh, ad for uh, 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 commercial advertisement for Intel. But I remember a couple of years ago, maybe five years ago, Intel had a and on TV, a, a person in a bunny suit and inside uh, uh, their fab, and uh, that's fabrication. And uh, what they try to prevent is that if your hair falls onto a wafer, then a bunch of chips will be defective chips. And each chip, they, when they finish, is probably a couple hundred dollars worth. That means if your hair across two chips, then they lose a thousand dollars because of your hair. So that's why they want you to cover up every part of your, your body before you go in there. 
uh, measurement, capitalization, and the sales, marketing. So uh, these are what, uh, if you have a bachelor's degree, you can do uh, any of these jobs. And, uh, but uh, certain jobs require a little bit more advanced knowledge or, or experience or degree. Job opportunities uh, in the electronic device business, integrate circuits and system, and the free scale on semi, and I don't think free scale is still in existence. But Ansem is here in local, and Intel has a couple of fabs in local. Actually, I have quite a few students working for Intel now. And also, for, I have quite a few students for working for uh, tax instrument, and one for IBM, and uh, two for uh, Global uh, Foundry. And uh, I also have one student working for Micron. Micron is in Idaho, uh, making memory chips. Yeah, so I have one student working there. Uh, I don't think I have any still working for Apple or HP and uh, Photonics. Photonics company tend to be a little bit smaller than, than these because Intel is like a $50 billion uh, annual revenue company. And, uh, but if you can look at the Photonics industry, Amco, and the Amco makes the equipment to grow semiconductor films. And uh, yeah, some of these I have not heard actually, like uh, all. Or Clello. I don't even know where this company is. Raytheon is a defense contractor, Boeing, and Lockheed Martin. Uh, they all need the photonics. One thing I'm not sure if you know why people want to do optical communication instead of using a, a electrical communication. What's the advantage of optical communication? Have you thought about it? No? Optical communication is hard to intercept. So military always use optical communication. And uh, e electrical communication, you always have this electrical magnetic wave which you emit. So if you have sensitive enough sensor, you can always pick up that signal. That's how we intercept, say, say, say putting, talking to somebody, or, or whatever. And uh, that's because if they use the electrical communication, that's the reason. But if it's optical communication, it's much more difficult to, to, to intercept that. That's why defense uh, uh, really wants optical communication. Equipment manufacturer, yeah, I have many friends working for applied materials. That's the uh, number one uh, 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 equipment maker. And the KLA, yeah, I have a couple of students in I have a friend there. And uh, uh, digital instruments, uh, case these are all like uh, more like uh, agile. And these are make like uh, electronic instruments we use in lab or in production. And the solar industry, and uh, for solar, you drive from here to the airport on uh, 202, you see the headquarter there. So first of all, it's actually very close to us. Sun Power is uh, uh, in California, and uh, uh, there's a solar world which is in Oregon, which is not listed here. But uh, there are just many, many different types of companies or positions uh, you can, get, uh, you, 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 you can uh, find. Them. Now, the next question is, uh, do you just want a bachelor's degree? or you want to get an advanced degree, an MS or PhD. Bachelor degree is really entry level nowadays in, in this uh, tech business. And uh, you, you have bachelor degree, you go to Intel, you really start from the bottom of the ladder, and then gradually climb up. And, uh, but it takes you know, many years to, to, to get up at, uh, at there. So, but the, the advantage of a bachelor degree, it's more flexible because you are not specialized in anything yet. So you can fit into a very many different types of positions, but uh, they typically the companies understand that uh, I bring you in as long as you're smart, you work harder, you are easy to get along. I will bring you in, but I will train you. I don't expect you to be able to do your job on day one. I give you at least, at least three months, even six months, or even a year, just to bring you up to speed so you can do your job. So that's typically what happens with bachelor degrees. And uh, now, of course, if you just get into marketing, then you don't need uh, a really more technical knowledge. A math degree is a very good degree because you have a little bit more knowledge, a little bit more experience, but you are not very specialized yet. So uh, a lot of companies uh, like uh, uh, math degrees, and uh, but uh, now it depends. Actually, if you, I think uh, I, at least you know, two types of position, you don't even need a, a math degree. If you do circuit design, if you do computer programming, 
you don't even need a master's degree. I know uh, uh, kids who are out of college with a bachelor's degree and join uh, Google and uh, Microsoft and Amazon for like 130k a year, just bachelor's degree. What you need is you need to be very good in logic thinking, very good in programming. And then just, just, just that coding and that's all it takes. And circuit design is similar. You have a very limited number of uh, rules or principles you follow, and then just everything else is just a logic based on that, based on that set of rules. So you don't need advanced degree to do that. But uh, if you wa want to work for, say, for as a process or equipment engineer for Intel, most of them have PhDs because that requires much more experience than that. Now, one thing is that PhDs are very, very specialized. So it's not like uh, I have a PhD, I can apply any, any opening out there. You, it becomes much more specialized. Your training is this specific area, then you look for opening in, in this particular area. And uh, yeah, it's good for those who are interested in advanced, more interesting work. And uh, now if you want to be a research or professor, Nowadays, without a PhD, don't even think about it. Nobody will hire you without a PhD, as you would never hire somebody without a PhD. Even, even many of the lecturers we hire these days have PhD degrees, not uh, yeah, all the tenure, or tenure, tenure, or tenure check of, uh, professors, they all have PhDs. And if you go to like Intel and say, I want to work, Intel has a couple of research centers, one in, in Portland, Oregon, one in uh, 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 San Jose. If you look at, the, actually I visited the Intel, the Portland Center many years, 20, 25 years ago. I, I was a PhD student at Illinois, I was looking for jobs, so they brought me in there and uh, for interview. Then they said that, that at that time, the Intel Portland Technology Center had uh, like 2,000 employees. Like they said that like, uh, 1,300 of them are PhDs. The other technical support and uh, secretaries and uh, then out of 13, 100 PhDs, 300 of them actually got their PhD from Illinois. <laughs> they call them Illinois again there, so, <laughs> but yeah, ju just to see that. So if you want to do research type of position in any companies these days, you also need a PhD. Without PhD, yeah, my brother-in-law works for 3M, he's a very senior scientist there, and he has a PhD there, and so he's not the number one person in their floral parliament. So yeah, but you, uh, yeah, He's, yeah, because of my kids, not, most of my kids just graduated, my daughter just graduated, and my son graduated a couple of years ago. And uh, they decided not to go to graduate school, and then <laughs> my brother-in-law was saying that if you join a big company without advanced degree, like 3M, and he works for 3M, and 3M, all oh, it takes you forever to, to climb up the ladders. Because they hire so many PhDs already, so if you don't have a PhD, they just will not give you the most important jobs to you, because they have so many other well-qualified candidates around. So it depends on what type of position you need. Of course, if you just want to get into marketing sales, you don't need an advanced degree. So it depends on your uh, career goal. And so, and uh, now the other thing I probably should say that uh, if you want, if you don't want to do routine jobs day after day, day after day, getting advanced degree is probably also a good idea. That's a good idea. Uh, Saturday, also, this is uh, uh, outdated, uh, 2015. Uh, I can give you real numbers now. And uh, the students I have who joined, uh, like Intel or Texas Instruments or like, uh, like uh, other semiconductor companies, PhD, they are making about 120, 150K a year now, starting salary. And now 150K is more on the high end. Now, if, if you go to like a St. Jose Bay Area, then they typically are towards the high end because the living cost is so high. But some like uh, went to like uh, one went to Oregon, uh, 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 Portland, Oregon, 120k. 120k in Oregon, you can live very comfortably. Uh, so, so if you look at the weekly rate, that's almost like a twenty-five hundred dollars per week, and ten thousand dollars per month. And so these numbers are also a little bit. But you can see that. Uh, if you don't have a high school uh, uh, diploma and you get make 500, maybe $600 uh, a week, but if you have a PhD now, you can make $2,500 a week. 
Okay. Then uh, if you are really good, you can still advance. That's just the starting salary. That's not the, uh, the, the, the final salary you will get. Uh, no, sorry. The other thing is that the jobs tend to be more stable. Yeah. Now, when, when I think 2000, when, when was that? Uh, last dot com bubble, and I remember that a lot of people got laid off. But if a company, when they lay off people, you know what they do? These are the key technical person. The business will pick up in two, three years, five years. We still need these people. And then let it go. Who? The less skilled people. Because those people can easily be replaced. But those highly skilled persons are more difficult to find. So they tend to keep those highly skilled persons. So the jobs are much more secure. Now, if you become a professor, <laughs> I can always joke about that. Once you get a tenure, the university has no reason to fire you except two cases. Either they say, okay, we no longer need the School of Electrical Engineering, then they, they kick you out, or you commit a, a felony. Yeah, th these are the only two reasons. Otherwise, unless I'm willing to I, I, I quit, otherwise the university can't really do anything with my, my, my job here. So that's even more stable. Now, of course, there's a downside. That means some people, if they are not really, you, you can just sit back and have a, a, a <laughs> relaxed life and without doing much, and uh, which is not good for, um, for yourself, or for your own career, for the university. But uh, I, I know there are people who do that. But that means the job is very secure yeah, once you become a professor, for a tenured professor. Uh, Causes and uh, so these are the key uh, uh, causes you can choose from. Now these are I'm talking about electives now, and uh, uh, I think you need to pick up like uh, <coughs> forgot uh, five or six of the electives uh, to become a uh, 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 have a major in this area. Four thirty four quantum mechanics for engineers, and uh, you probably have been exposed to quantum mechanics in physics, uh, maybe uh, second or third physics class. Uh, fundamentals are CMOS and MEMS. Now, CMOS is the electronic device which is most commonly used. And uh, it's a, such a common device we use today. And uh, 436 is a fundamental solid state devices uh, which goes beyond the CMOS and MEMS, also covers other devices like the LEDs, uh, light emitting dials, lasers, and uh, CCD uh, charge coupled. Uh, uh, if you use a Computer chip, you use a chip to image you. You need a uh, CCD camera to do that. Uh, Opto electronics, uh, lasers, LEDs, and uh, also there are other devices, photo detectors. And the 439 semiconductor facilities and clean room practices, that teaches you what to do when you go into the fab of Intel. What are the general rules you need to follow? And uh, uh, then uh, 465 is a new. Uh, 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 Established cause are uh, photovoltaic energy conversion that teaches you how to convert the sunlight into electricity. Okay. Uh, did I do something? Yeah, okay, that's the last slide. I, I did not realize this is the last slide. Okay, so we still have time for questions. Yeah, I was asking questions to some of you, and uh, have you all decided uh, what major you want to get into? Or uh, you're still open-minded? Uh, or so have, have some uh, have some clue, but uh, need a little bit more information. Yeah. I just kind of had a just kind of a question on class. So the analog and digital circuits class three thirty-five. Um, I guess from a professor's perspective, and go over what that is, because that's kind of the intro class for the prereqs for a lot of things. Uh, okay, uh, 334, 335 was supposed to be in circuits area, not in physical electronics area. Yeah, so I taught 334, but I never taught 335. Yeah, so I never taught analog, because analog circuits are still widely used, but not as common as digital circuits. So yeah, uh, so I don't know much about the 335 actually. Yeah, you know, Cheryl? Okay. But come next week to the pathways, it's supposed to be on circuits. Okay. Yeah, so now where 
typically the way we uh, uh, we di differentiate between circuits and uh, physical electronics is that uh, we make those like uh, this single laser or uh, single transistor. Now we actually go beyond that. We also put a lot of transistors together to make integrated circuits. Then uh, we uh, we lo look at to see how each transistor works and uh, how to improve the performance of each transistor. And then we also study how to make them, how to put the billions of them uh, in, in, onto the same chip. But actually, there's also another part is that how these transistors should be connected. That's the circuit design. Yeah, that's a, 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 a not. It's good that uh, for us to know a little bit about circuit design. So I teach circuits uh, 202 and 334. But uh, yeah, I still want to stay in this physical electronics domain, uh, not into circuits domain. So that's why. Yeah. So yeah, I should have mentioned the next for Thursday. Also, there will be free pizza as well. <laughs> Oh, clear. Okay. So, how many of you have decided to get into uh, uh, physical electronics? We call it a PEP. Kind of, uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, what uh, now? If I take a look, how many of you want to get, get into, uh, say, power power systems? No, no power. Uh, kind of okay. Undecided. Uh, and how many wants to get into circuits? Okay, good, sorry, okay. And uh, we also have e electromagnetics, and uh, that's, uh, I guess, probably not many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you guys even enjoy 241? Oh. <laughs> but actually, a lot of defense companies actually hire people in EMAX, because when they design the antenna, when, when, uh, yeah, that's, that's a very t typical uh, EMAX uh, problem. But you need to know how to solve those all those like Maxwell equations. But today, actually, you use software. You don't do it manually. <laughs> you use software. You just need to know how to run the software and also all the parameters you, you type in what they represent. Okay. So how many of you are uh, uh, no no seniors here, right? Uh, you have a senior, one senior. No. Ah, no. Oh. Oh, no senior. Okay. I'm a senior. Oh, yeah, senior? Yeah. So you haven't decided? Uh, no, I'm doing controls and community. Oh, control, control. Yeah. <coughs> control is another area. We, uh, we also have a project on uh, pretty much control, but the control solar system. Yeah. We're quite here. <laughs> yeah. So um, you're kind of going into this pathway like solid state electronics or like uh, Um We do have to take four pathways, um, and of course one of them would be 352. But what other three would you recommend? Uh, it depends, and. Uh, If you now, this one is more fundamental. The first one, quantum mechanics, is more fundamental, and uh, uh, because the lasers, the LED, all channels, not all involve some uh, kind of quantum physics. And uh, this one is more of on the uh, CMOS side. So it's what uh, Intel does, and uh, Texas Instruments does, and uh, Micron does. And a lot of the Korean or Japanese companies also do, do, this, uh, do this. And uh, this is a more generic uh, and uh, uh, optoelectronics, if you want to say find a job in displays or in lasers, LEDs, uh, and uh, this is what you take. And this is a generic class because uh, they all involve some kind of application, and so they, you all always need to know uh, when you go into clean room and what they are supposed to do, what they are not supposed to do. So that teaches you that idea. And also, a big issue is that how do you keep the air free of particles? 
yeah, they have very specific uh, requirements. Uh, because the, the, each transistor is 10 nanometers, the particles floating in air can be up to like a, a micron in size. So if a micron size particle falling onto your chip, it covers like 20 transistors. That chip will certainly be dead. Because you cannot do anything to a subsequent fabricating processes to make those transistors. So that's, that's part of the reason how to keep clean and uh, see they have like class 10, even class 1. That means each cubic meter of air, there can be only one particle of one micron size. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, now this is my, personally I, I'm biased, but uh, personally I think that uh, uh, when I studied my faculty uh, career and uh, 20, 22 years ago, and I, I, I was in Texas, so I worked with a lot of those semiconductor companies. I worked with, in, uh, not Intel, I worked with IBM, worked with Texas Instruments, worked with uh, Motorola, at that time Motorola was still around, and uh, Semtech and uh, SRC, just to see how you can make CMOS better performance and uh, faster. But a uh, couple of reasons for me to quit that research and uh, start doing, doing, doing photovoltaics now. One is that uh, if you look at, uh, say, when Intel build a new fab, you know the price tag these days? A new fab for, is $10 billion for Intel to put in, to build that. Now, no university can afford even, say, $10 million to build a lab for you to work in. So you can see that you just don't have the necessary equipment to do the things of interest to them. So that's part of the reason, because they are, are capability-wise uh, aside, they are so advanced that uh, there's very little university can do. So that's why nowadays you don't get much uh, 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 CMOS research in universities. There are only like less than a handful of universities in the United States which still does CMOS research. So that's one of the reasons. On the other hand, I also kind of feel that, uh, now this is my personal view, and uh, it doesn't mean that what Intel does is not good. It's still good because everybody needs a computer. But on the other hand, I feel that um, what, because John Barton invented that transistor, then it's already 70, 80 years later, and a lot of smart people and, uh, have made their contributions now. We are at this stage. Whatever I can do on top of that, is not going to have a huge impact. I can make a little bit improvement here, a little bit improvement there, but it's not going to fundamentally change the semiconductor industry. But if you look at energy, we're still burning fossil fuels. 90% of energy we use to come from fossil fuels. And if you look at the, 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 the UN climate report, that's a far big issue under which there are so many questions, problems there and we don't have a good answers yet. So now, I'm the same intelligence, I make the same effort, I spend, invest the same amount of time, and, but I work on problems, in my view, is more important, and so I can make a much bigger impact uh, from my research than focusing on CMOS. Yeah, because the whole building is almost done, and you, you, you put a nice window a color on it. Again, it looks nice, but uh, does that really change that building, the foundation of that building? No, it does not change. But uh, this building is just being built and, uh, from scratch. Now, you put a foundation here versus there, that makes a difference of how that building will look like. So that's why uh, I decided to focus more on for the vortex. Yeah. So would you say this field especially leads into like job titles? Yeah, so uh, now you, you can do device design, you can do uh, uh, device uh, engineers actually, you design devices and somebody will make it for you. You can be process engineer, which means you, you make devices and uh, somebody design you make devices. You can also be like equipment engineer, which uh, you, because they have a really, really fancy, just give you some numbers. The tools uh, Intel use in their fabs, each tool, you know, the price tag is probably on the order of $50 million per machine. Then when Intel buys, they buy 30 of them <laughs> and they put in a load. And so you, you see, so it's, it gets really, really, uh, so how to, 
keep the equipment up and running. That's also very, because if one step is down, Intel shuts down the fab for one hour, they lose tens of millions of dollars. So now that's the, the other side of, of being an equipment engineer. Midnight, they pick up the phone, this machine is done, you have to come here in 30 minutes, you have to be there. Because you, you go there, 6 a.m., they already lost $100 million. <laughs> then your, your boss, your boss, boss will be, uh, 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 go after you for sure if you don't show up in 30 minutes. But uh, on the other hand, they need a very sophisticated, uh, very hands on, not only have good fundamental knowledge, but also very hands on skills with vacuum, electricity, chemicals, mechanics. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you need to fix that machine. Yeah. Yeah, so these are more on the technical side. But if you just get a bachelor degree and you go to Intel, I guess you could be a assistant to a, say, a PhD engineer and uh, or maybe, yeah, in many cases, I don't know, also a lot of bachelor degrees and uh, end up being like a tech cell engineer. Yeah, Intel has this product. Uh, you need to understand all the specs and, uh, and then you can talk to customers and. Uh, Based on their requirements, you can find the right product from Intel's uh, products line and then recommend, oh, this is the thing you need to use. So things like that nature, yeah. So there are different type of, types of positions you can have, and uh, it's, uh, electrical engineer is certainly a very good degree to have because it allows you, now on one hand, it's not an easy degree. So they know, once you, once you graduate, they know you're smart. And then once you're smart, then you can fit into more types of position than say a say English major, right? Uh, English major they certainly will not uh, ask you to be a tech sales person, right? Because you, you don't understand what uh, the different specs of different chips. Uh, just for example. Yeah. Okay. All clear? Yeah, so uh, uh, now if you have an additional question, you can certainly email me. Just my first name, dot, last name at ASU. So you can email me. I will try to answer your question to the best I can. And if it's not in my uh, area, I can certainly connect you with the right professor. Or uh, sometimes you can also talk to uh, their students or my students as well. So they have. Uh, yeah, I have uh, how many students? Well, five students right now. So one undergraduate student, four PhD students. So yeah, if you have a specific question about a specific. Uh, uh, uh. Now another thing I think is that you can check out is that uh, ASU has this field uh, photo undergraduate research initiative. There's a website. So if uh, as an undergraduate student, if you want to get uh, more exposure to the different research uh, going on at, uh, uh, at ASU. You can check out the website. Different professors list their different projects. And uh, at this time, uh, probably you just read the title, see, okay, that sounds interesting. And uh, But once you get into it, then you will understand a little bit more. And uh, if you have been exposed to two, three different projects, then you probably will be able to find, okay, this is the most interesting to me. Okay. Okay, good. So if no more questions, then I will call it off. Thank you very much. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Kira. Thank you.